YouTube will pick a picture and unfortunately it usually is when I've got my face something like this. So uh, of course now that I've done that, that's definitely what's going to show up. So our readings today come from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, continuing the parables and sayings that Jesus shared and that we've been discussing the last several weeks. Starting at verse 31. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood this? They, he asked, and they answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven it's like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, out of his treasure, what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus asked his audience if they understood. I'm afraid that if he asked us, many of us, myself included, would not necessarily fully understand what he was getting at. We'll get back to that in a minute. Last week we talked about surprises. And we're continuing in with that same passage. But today it's more about the surprising power that some things can have, even in small amounts. If you've ever tried to make a recipe and you've gotten confused between a teaspoon of salt and a tablespoon of salt, you'll know the difference when you taste the result. Or if you put too little of something. Some things, just a little bit, can make a difference. There are some things in our lives that show up in these kind of illustrations Jesus gives that may not look very impressive, but they can have a big effect. All of these illustrations are about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is trying to talk about God's rule, God's plan. But what does that word even mean? In the ancient world, they often spoke of God as king. It was an analogy they could use because they understood what a human king was like. Their absolute power, their control, their ability to tell someone to do something, and they did it. So when they couldn't always understand or explain what God was like, they would say, well, we know what kings are, so God is a king. God is just the heavenly, universal king in power over everything. But sometimes God's power, God's ways, God's plan may not seem like they're in control. Sometimes things are out of order. Sometimes when bad things happen, people don't get justice. Sometimes people feel like they're waiting for God to restore that order. As we say in the prayer we just shared, thy kingdom come. But now, sometimes using that idea of a king may not be so helpful. 
kings in the Bible and throughout history have not always been good. So for some people, to call God king might be a scary thought. And you may have noticed in the prayers this morning, and it wasn't a typo, although it could have looked that way, they said kingdom instead of kingdom. It was a little bit of a play on words, but it wasn't just an omission of the G. Some theologians have used that phrase to say that when we speak of God's kingdom, that God's kingdom is different from those human kingdoms we've known. Because again, throughout history, many kings have been totalitarians. They have mercilessly eliminated their enemies. And so some people say maybe we don't want to imitate that. But if we think of all people as part of God's family, to then instead speak of the kingdom, God reuniting us as one human family, is a powerful sign of hope. Now again, sometimes we look at the world and we may think that the kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus imagines has not come to pass. Many people in Jesus' time and in our own grieve at what we see in the world. And we want God to act. But we don't know how that will happen. We don't know what form those actions will take. And as we talked in previous weeks, sometimes we might not even recognize when God is acting. But then, of course, the question is also, will God act sort of in those grand and dramatic moments, bolts of lightning or something? Or instead, is God acting through people, possibly even through us? So this is the other part of the puzzle. Are we waiting for that kingdom to come about? Are we waiting for someone else to do it? Or is it something that can be here now? Maybe already the seeds of it, to continue that theme from these parables, the seeds of the kingdom are here now, already sprouting, already taking life in us and in what we can do to transform the world. So the parable, the first part of it, talks about seeds. And some seeds are big pumpkin seeds and acorns and others, even avocado pits, but some are small, so tiny you can barely see them, and somehow it often seems that it's the weeds that have those tiny seeds and often seem to grow very well. I have some wildflowers, or perhaps again maybe some would call them weeds in my yard. The seeds are tiny, and yet the plants grow taller than me and do much better than the sunflowers I tried to plant, and the Heads got broken off this week, even before they flowered. Go figure. I heard a couple of you talking about the mustard seeds, and I think I've shared this story. When I was, I think, about six or seven, the Baptists sent out little packets of mustard seeds to churches, and, well, at my dad's church, they encouraged people to plant them, and so we planted them in a pot, and by the time it was done, it reached the ceiling and was like bending along the ceiling. And so they took my brother's night picture with it, and it it actually showed up in the national magazine for, for our branch of the Baptists. Of course, I'm like this tall, and the plant is so much taller. Jesus talking about that mustard seed might have been a little bit shocking or ironic to his listeners because, as I understand, some people may have viewed that as a weed. Why would someone go out and intentionally plant that weed? It also talks about yeast. Again, I, I mentioned a few moments ago the issue of recipes. I have not had much luck trying to make bread, even when I get completely fresh yeast and all good ingredients, it doesn't always work, and bread can also often depend on the humidity and everything. Um, But there's a story in our family 
that my wife likes to tell of her stepmother, who of course is, I should note, always the one who says, read all the instructions before you do anything. And her stepmother wanted to make challah. The, you know, you may have seen it sometimes, it's, it's a traditional Jewish recipe, it's the braided bread, and it's a little bit sweet, and so, so it's very, very, very tasty. And her stepmother was at, alone at the house and so couldn't consult with anybody else on this. And she says, oh, well, I've seen them do it. I can do it, no problem. So she measured out the ingredients and she looked in the bowl. So it, it doesn't look, look like it's gonna be enough for four loaves. I'll double it. And hala takes a long time to rise and it rises substantially. And so she said, oh, well, I've got a couple hours. I'll, I'll go run some errands and I'll come back. And because she doubled it and did not look at the end of the recipe where it says, makes four loaves, she came back and that dough was oozing and dripping down all the kitchen cabinets. Yeast is almost invisible. And yet, without it, we would not have bread. We wouldn't have beer either, that's a whole other story. But that little bit of yeast can make all the difference. Jesus then shares a couple other interesting illustrations. One seems a little bit dishonest because it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure, and so he hides it, he doesn't tell anybody, and then he goes and buys the field so that he can have the treasure. Now, hopefully, at least, he gave a fair price for it, but it reminded me, in a sense, of some of those TV shows where people are trying to buy up the old storage units or, or something, or they're going antiquing, and they see something really valuable, but they, of course, don't tell the person, well, y y you know, you're selling this for $5. Hey, you know, you're, you're, you're losing a lot of money here. But the bigger point is that that man in the story was willing to take the risk, willing to buy the whole field just for that treasure. Or similarly, the pearl. The pearl was so valuable that the merchant was willing to spend all he had to buy it. Some of these sayings are almost puzzles. They're contradictions. They're not definitions in the way a dictionary definition would work. Instead, they're stories to make us think, to think about the fact that, well, God is like this, but also God is like that. In Muslim tradition, there's a practice of praying by reciting all the names of God that are used in the Quran. And some of them are almost contradictory. God is the lover, and God is the destroyer. God is the creator and the destroyer. God is the beginning and the end. God is the forgiver, and God is the judger. And if you look through the list, in, in Muslim tradition, there's 99 of those names. Most of them are also found in the Bible, in Christian and Jewish tradition. But the point is that those names, those descriptions are a little bit contradictory. But it's a reminder to us that God is not... Excuse me. Coughing under these circumstances probably isn't a good idea. Um, God is not something we can control. There was a book several decades ago called Your God is Too Small. And the idea was that if we try to define God and say God is this, and God is only this, that we're limiting God. God is beyond the limitations we can make. These puzzles that Jesus gives to make people think still make us think, still make us wonder, to try to figure out what God is like, to try to figure out what God's way is like and how we can connect with that, how we can find hope. We can find faith like that mustard seed. 
but that we can also find ways that we too can serve in the world. There's a UCC pastor who shared this on Facebook yesterday, and, and a lot of pastors were saying, hmm, maybe we'll use this. And she commented that too often in churches we end up trying to make a creed, defining God in defining faith, whereas these parables and other things from the Bible sort of stretch us. So she wrote this and shared this poem called The Parab Parabler's Creed. Her, the pastor's name is Marin Tirabasi, by the way. She wrote, I believe in God, the hen all sheltering, creator of mustard seed and yeast, and in Jesus, the vine, door, and living water, who was conceived by the wind, born of the magnifier, suffered under a builder of bigger barns, burst the old wineskins, died like the least of every generation, and was hidden like treasure. Jesus met those in the pig yard, and the third day was found by those who kept oil for their lamps. Jesus ascended into the Zoom wedding banquet and sits at the right hand of the shepherd, with the beggar at the gate on the other side and a dog curled at their feet. From thence Jesus comes to the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers, the convicts, and COVID patients on ventilators. I believe in the dove and the flame, the abundant but stinking fishnet, the inn a Samaritan trusts, a ring, sandals, fatted beyond burger for all of us, equal pay for all the workers in the vineyard, and a holy lost and found of coin of coins, sheep, and remarkable pearls. God is beyond our conception. God is working in ways we can't always understand. And some of these sayings may not give us some of the encouragement we were looking for. But at the same time, looking at these puzzles, at the ideas of small things bringing big changes, choosing to value what's important, what's worth the price. We too can think about what is important, pay attention to it, and try to choose the right priorities, and be aware of what we can do even when it is difficult. Amen. I'll close with the benediction and then some music to wind us up for the day. Let us go forth in wisdom, in hope, and in courage, with hearts open to recognize the signs of the reign of God in our midst, and courage to create more space for grace in our lives and our world. Amen.